So it is truly a great pleasure and an honor to host Harvey Lodish as today's very distinguished guest speaker in our weekly IRCM seminar series. I got to know Harvey in the 1970s because of his pioneering work on glycoproteins. And from his 1986, uh, and for his lead contribution to nine editions of Molecular Cell Biology, a textbook reference. Harvey obtained his PhD in genetics at the Rockefeller Inst University in New York, and then joined Sidney Brenner and Francis, Francis Crick as a postdoctoral fellow at the MRC in Cambridge, UK. There, he focused on understanding the regulation of protein translation using de novo biosynthetic analysis. In those days, you could not buy S35-methionine. And hence, based on Fred Sanger's protocol, he had to make it himself from a culture of baker's yeast and 50 millicurie of S35 sulfate. He pursued this subject for two more years after he joined the MIT faculty in 1968 in Boston, where he remained ever since. Now, throughout his career, both as a postdoc and as a principal investigator, Harvey often took on high-risk projects that opened up new fields of research. Importantly, he allowed his and many talented postdocs to take with them a large part of their research projects when they left his group to start their own laboratories. Consequently, every few years, he had to reinvent part of his lab to work on yet another risky project. So during, so let me give you three representative examples of the breadth of subjects that Dr. Harvey Lodish have dealt with. He was a pioneer in the expression cloning to identify GLUT family of glucose transporters, starting with GLUT1, fatty acid transporter band 3, as well as receptors such as those of erythropoietin, TGF beta 1, and others. Notably, the cell li this line of research was not funded. Why? Because NIH reviewer claimed that he had no track record in expression cloning technology, especially for multiple subunit proteins. He definitely proved them wrong. His team also characterized novel genes controlling erythropoiesis and elucidated the role of some microRNA and long knock coding RNAs in regulating hematopoiesis fat cell development and metabolism. In an exciting new translational technological development, which we will present to us, he is now using red blood cells as vehicles for the introduction of novel therapeutics, immunomodulatory agents, and diagnostic imaging probes in the human body. During his career spanning 52 years, Harvey has trained more than 200 medical doctors, PhDs, MD, PhD students, and fellows. Two received both the Nobel Prize and the Lasker Award, and eight have been elected to the US National Academy of Sciences and or National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Lodrich is, is a recipient of many distinguished awards and has given numerous keynote and endowed international lectures. He has more than 760 publications in high to very high impact journals, his H index is 154. And his work has been cited on average more than 1400 times a year, with some publications cited over 2700 times a year. This is highly impressive. In parallel to all these exciting scientific discoveries, Dr. Lodish founded the Whitehead Institute and served as president of the American Society for Cell Biology. As we will hear from his lecture, Dr. Lodish was a founder and member of the scientific advisory board of eight biotech companies, including Genzyme, Millennium Pharmaceuticals, Tevar Therapeutics, Rubius, Carmine, and Cerberus. Today, we are very lucky to have him present to us an insightful perspective of how fundamental research can lead to exciting translational applications in human diseases. So I would like to uh, just show you one slide, uh, which will uh, 
you want, I'll share it with you. This is his family. He has nurtured with so many students and, and postdocs relationship over the years. And you can see that they were uh, basically uh, gathered for his 50 years of his opening of his lab. And so this shows how much he has influenced the young and the less young uh, uh, scientists in this world. Dr. Lotish has graciously allowed us to record his presentation for future distribution. So I, I will now let Lodish, Dr. Lodish present his talk. So please share with us your, your slide, Dr. Lodish. Ah, thank you so much for that over generous introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, as you heard, my, hold on. There we go. Okay. Um, as you heard, in my heart, I'm a basic scientist. I've run a research lab at MIT for over 50 years. And my real interest has always been in understanding basic life processes. But as you can see here, I've been part of the biotechnology industry for over 40 years, dating to a company which did not succeed, Damon Biotech, but a company that succeeded beyond our dreams, Genzyme, which pioneered therapies for rare diseases. And I've also had the honor of serving with the Massachusetts government, uh, worked with the governor to set up the Life Sciences Center and distribute about $700 million in taxpayer money to enhance biotechnology in Massachusetts. And since 2007, I've been privileged to serve on the board of trustees of Boston Children's Hospital, where I had oversight of all the research at the hospital. So my focus today is going to be on biotechnology. And I've divided my talk into five sections, six sections actually. First, uh, the importance of faculty members as entrepreneurs. That is, most of the developments in biotechnology and most of the successful companies have started by faculty taking research out of their laboratories or working with others in the same field to start biotech companies to develop treatments for unmet medical diseases. And this will allow me to segue into the development of the Cambridge Biotechnology ecosystem and particularly my long-term focus on therapies for rare diseases. I do this introductory material for an important reason. Um, a lot of very good science gets lost if it is not translated into a biotech or other for-profit company. And many cities and many countries have the opportunity and the ability to develop the kind of ecosystem that we have surrounding MIT and Harvard to develop biotechnology and to build on the discoveries in your universities and research hospitals. Then I'll give three examples. I won't talk about Rubius, but I will talk about Genzyme, uh, where we developed an enzyme replacement therapy for a rare disease, Gaucher disease, and then talk about two of my newer companies, Carmine and Tivard, which are developing gene therapy treatments for difficult to treat unmet medical needs. So let me begin with an almost philosophical statement that you can see. That is what we do in our academic laboratories 
is not develop drugs, but we research the underlying basic cellular molecular biology genetics of human disease. Uh, we're supported by governments, we're supported by patient or disease-based organizations, and many of us get philanthropic support for our research. But our goal is not a drug, but it's one of the more candidate therapeutics that work in what we call preclinical models, cell culture, experimental animals. But without patenting these discoveries and licensing them to a for-profit entity, these academic discoveries can become buried in the literature. Companies do not want to take up new technologies unless they can have exclusive license to them. And that requires strong intellectual property protection. And what we're going to be talking about today are really the collaboration between academic institutions and for-profit companies, supported by venture capital, uh, perhaps supported by patient organizations, startup companies predominantly, but their interaction with multinational biopharmaceutical companies. And it's only there that you can really get a therapeutic that is approved in the United States by the FDA, but a therapeutic that is available to all patients worldwide. And this is really our goal. And to remind everyone, the actual development of a drug costs tens to hundreds of millions of US dollars. The research that we do in our universities is actually a small part of it financially. Um, there's a great deal of preclinical work that needs to get done in the company to take what we have, prove it is safe, and prove it is effective in whatever animal models are available. They often involve non-human primates and it gets very expensive. But it's the clinical trials, the phase one trial, which basically looks at safety and dose escalation up to the phase two and phase three trials that really cost huge amounts of money, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And this of course requires for-profit institutions. To start a biotech company, here we go, requires a number of skills and a number of people. It requires an entrepreneurial faculty. Uh, the group that has the expert knowledge that can really begin uh, and take this into the uh, business world. Uh, I'll stress the importance of a top scientific advisory board, experts in the field, mostly academics, a board of directors that has scientific expertise, but also the business expertise to handle the finances of the company and build it up through a number of fundraising stages to the point where it can have perhaps a public offering or be sold to a larger company. Uh, you need experienced workers. That is, most biotechs, only a quarter of the workers are actually PhDs or MDs. Uh, many have four-year college degrees, but many of them have less than four-year college degrees. You need an awful lot of people who can run the machines, who can do the ordering, and so forth. I've already stressed the importance of proprietary and protected intellectual property. You need financial backing. I'm often asked the role of government. Uh, it creates the infrastructure, perhaps the incubators, the support of the universities, and so forth. But government funding of companies uh, gets somewhat risky, and perhaps in the Q&A afterwards, we can talk about it. <coughs> What makes much of this possible in the United States is the fact that as workers in faculty members in research universities, we get one day outside professional activity. 
As I often put it, MIT pays me for five days, but I really work four. We can own stock in companies. We can consult for companies. There are very clear conflict of interest rules. So I've been doing this, as I said, for a little over 40 years. And this is important, the notion of entrepreneurs, because it was faculty who led the biotech revolution in the early 1980s, when recombinant DNA technology enabled the production of monoclonal antibodies, and those I'll describe with genzyme recombinant therapeutic proteins, the Gaucher drug, but also insulin and other growth factors. And what we're seeing now is a revolution in basic biology that is leading to entirely new types of therapies. Cell therapies, replacement cells, engineered cells such as CAR T cells, therapeutics based on DNA and RNA, gene therapies, and so forth. And I'm not alone. I want to stress this. That is, when I look at my 20 or so colleagues at the Whitehead Institute, a research institute affiliated with MIT, over half of my colleagues have not just started biotech companies, but have started companies that raise the resources to have public stock offerings. And you can see the diversity of people who have done this. Another example, Moderna Pharmaceuticals is in the news with the vaccine development. And I list here the founding scientific advisory board of Moderna, headed by Jack Shostak, a Nobel Prize winner. But you can see in the red asterisks, six of the advisory board members are members of the National Academy. This is a very high level group. And I point out, among other people, Betsy Nabel, who's president of the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Parenthetically, that has now created a conflict. She's resigned from the board because Brigham and Women's is testing some of the Moderna vaccines. But the point is, uh, throughout the United States, it has been the top scientists who have started biotech companies. Turning to the Cambridge biotech ecosystem, a few comments because there are lessons which many cities and many countries and provinces and states all over the world can take from this. Geography is very important. What I point out here in this arrow is the Whitehead Institute surrounded by a large complex of buildings. Here's MIT, almost all of which house rented laboratories, some owned by the company, some rented various incubators for biotechnology. It's a huge ecosystem. And the geography is very important. Here is the Whitehead Institute. This street intersection is Kendall Square. The whole area is now known as Kendall Square. When I started Rubius about six years ago, I started with a venture capital firm, Flagship Ventures, that is located literally a 10 minute walk down the street. The beginning, the first Rubius location was in this incubator space, Lab Central, a not-for-profit incubator supported by the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, this not-for-profit that I helped chair uh, and gave the $10 million to renovate this incubator. This is housed now 40 or so startup companies, almost all of which have left Lab Central to move into larger spaces. And the first rented space that Rubius went to after Lab Central was on Vassar Street, again, about a 15 minute walk from my office. So geography is very important. But this is the probably the most important slide, which is the same aerial view I showed before uh, about 45 years ago. It's an empty, polluted industrial wasteland. 
And Kendall Square and with its biotech companies grew organically because of the companies that were started by MIT faculty, beginning with Biogen, Genzyme, Replogen, and a handful of others in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, the Whitehead Institute on the corner of Maine and Vassar Street, Kendall Square as it were, uh, was the pioneer. This was the Whitehead Institute in the late 70s. Here it is in 1983. Whitehead, in turn, um, housed the Her Human Genome Project, led by Eric Lander. And Eric, in turn, received huge philanthrop philanthropic support from Eli Brode, a Los Angeles industrialist. And I show this slide to make several important points. The main one being the collaboration between institutions that often compete with each other. Uh, this is a photograph taken at the dedication of the Broad Institute, which is formally a collaboration between Harvard, MIT, and the Harvard Teaching Hospital, such as Mass General, uh, Brigham and Women's, Beth Israel, Boston Children's, and so forth. The hospitals are independent entities. Harvard and MIT traditionally compete with each other. But here you see Eric Lander, the Broad president, Susan Hockfield and Drew Faust, the presidents respectively of MIT and Harvard. The government, as I've stressed, the Massachusetts government is supportive and on the same page. It was Governor Patrick whose vision set up the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center this $100 million uh, a year over 10 year initiative. That's a billion dollars, that's a thousand million uh, to support life sciences. He was on board. You see Mr. and Mrs. Broad and David Baltimore, the founding chair of the Whitehead Institute who chaired the board of the Broad Institute. So collaboration getting all the institutions, the politicians from the state from the local uh, authorities, in this case, Cambridge, on the same page is extremely important. So let me move on to what has been a focus of my own career in biotechnology, which is rare diseases. And as I'll stress, rare diseases are actually not so rare. The legal definition, because of the orphan drug bill that I will discuss shortly, it's a legal definition of any disease or condition that affects fewer than 200,000 citizens of the United States. China is coming up with their definition. It will probably be 500,000 citizens. This is an awful lot of people with a single disease. There are more than 6,800 rare diseases documented. And roughly speaking, 10% of the people in the world suffer from one or more rare diseases. Virtually all of them, not all, but almost all, are genetic in origin, present throughout a person's life, and usually affect uh, children. And what is very important, and I stress this everywhere I go, is because of intermarriage, every ethnic group, every indigenous group, every isolated religious group, uh, every island has its own constellation of rare autosomal recessive diseases, often confined or, re restri or enriched in this particular population. And I'll show some examples in a moment. And roughly half of the affected people are children. And what motivated a lot of activity in the United States, particularly Genzyme, is this Orphan Drug Act of 1983. I've stressed intellectual property, but this is different. 
As I said, any therapeutic, a drug, a vaccine, a diagnostic agent qualifies if they're intended to treat a disease affecting under 200,000 US citizens. And what you get is not patent protection, but market exclusivity for seven years. That is, the FDA will not approve a drug for the same indication, the same disease, giving you seven years of market exclusivity. This is very good if you're developing a product. It can be abused because you can set the price for whatever you want. There's no competition. You also get tax credits and various grants and fast track approval, but that's not the main reason. I show this list of rare diseases. And what I point out is that virtually all of them have been identified in Caucasian populations by Caucasian scientists. And very few have been studied in Native American or indigenous people really anywhere in the world, uh, particularly Asian or African populations. One example, cystic fibrosis, a well-studied genetic disease now with several cures from Vertex, which is almost exclusive uh, to descendants of Northern European Caucasians. I'll talk about the Chinese Organization for Rare Disorders in a moment. Um, I had the head of the organization, Kevin Wong, with me for several days in Boston. And I said, would you like to visit Vertex and see how they develop drugs for cystic fibrosis? And he said, no, we don't have cystic fibrosis in China. There's almost none of it, except the few Caucasians who have spread it. They have their own genetic diseases. And perhaps surprisingly, they don't know what they are yet. Um, two examples I've called from the literature, Iceland and Finland, which have traditionally been isolated populations, you have founders who uh, underwent a mutation in a particular gene, unknowingly their descendants had children, uh, having uh, autosomal recessive genetic diseases. I've just listed two of them here. I could have listed another perhaps 100 from different um, countries and different ethnic groups. And perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, very few of them have any treatment at all. And many of them are unstudied. I point out because there are many opportunities now with patient groups that are looking to support research for their own disease there are many opportunities for academic scientists to work on such diseases and then start or work with companies to um, develop therapies. And even without therapies, prenatal screening in these ethnic populations can be very powerful. Perhaps the earliest example is this group, Doria Sharim, that was founded in, among the Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn, New York. As I'm told, it was a rabbi, a religious leader, who had several children with a rare genetic disorder. And he prayed to God, saying, God, I am a righteous man. Why do you afflict me with this? And God replied, start genetic screening. And he did. He worked with a geneticist. They developed a prenatal screening protocol where every young person in this religious community, where there is, of course, many intermarriages, um, every young person as they go through adolescence had a genetic test for the diseases that affected this particular population. Originally, the young people were not told of the genetic results. When a couple wanted to marry, they would go visit the rabbi who would look at their genetic tests on a computer 
and either bless the union or say, you know, I'm sorry, this is not will by God. The point is within a generation, they have almost uh, eliminated many of these rare diseases from this population. Other communities are establishing this uh, sickle cell disease in African and African American communities, thalassemia in medical community, in Mediterranean communities and so forth. And one of the groups that I've been privileged to work with is this organization based on Beijing, the Chinese Organization for Rare Disorders. As you can see, the president, Kevin Wang, a remarkable man, uh, an incredible speaker, uh, suffers from his own genetic disorder. And the idea is to make China aware of rare diseases. Um, at this meeting in Beijing a few years ago, uh, one of the speakers was Brian Casper, the founder of Avexis, which developed gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. And in attendance were several of these ladies who had children with SMA. And they heard the results of the gene therapy. They saw babies who were destined to die literally, not figuratively, literally climb out of their cribs weeks after the gene therapy for SMA. What is sad is that this gene therapy is not available to them. China will not import these drugs. They're very expensive. And we need to figure out how to pay for these new treatments. It's a huge problem in its own right. Uh, Avexis, parenthetically, was bought for $8 billion by Novartis to do, expand this gene therapy. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of money at stake. Uh, Brian walked away with several hundred million dollars, Brian Casper, but a lot of patients uh, can go nowhere near the million or so dollars that's required. So there's a lot of work to do that involves not only the scientists, but um, business people and so forth. So with this lengthy introduction, let me talk about three of my companies, starting with the first very successful one, which is Genzyme. And our own work in their first therapeutic, which is an enzyme replacement therapy for a disease I suspect many of you have not heard of, Gaucher disease. Now, I founded Genzyme with eight faculty colleagues, all distinguished scientists from MIT. But the hero of the story is Henry Tremere. Henry is not a scientist. He sadly passed away several years ago. He was trained in business and worked in the blood products division of Baxter. He had the vision of converting Genzyme into a rare disease company. He, the businessman, understood the orphan drug law. He understood the patient need, the fact that there were many diseases that had no cure. He knew of work at NIH on enzyme replacement for Gaucher. And it was his vision and leadership that got the eight scientists on board that Genzyme would become primarily, not exclusively, but primarily a rare disease company. So for reasons that will become apparent, I want to spend a bit of time on the development of the treatment for Gaucher disease. Um, it's a lysosome storage disease. It's missing the enzyme beta glucocerebrosidase, which is essential for degradation of glucocerebroside, a glycolipid. Depending on how much, and, and there's a reason I'm telling you this, so pay attention. 
in severe cases where there's very, very little residual enzyme, the so-called type 2 and type 3 Gaucher disease, there is brain damage and early death. The more common type, type 1, is most prevalent in descendants of Eastern European Jews, Ashkenazic Jews. And it's progressive and it's debilitating. It can be life-threatening. It mainly affects <coughs> macrophage cells that in the periphery, not in the brain, are the principal cells that degrade glycolipids. They're the cells that will degrade apoptotic cells, um, cells that are broken open by viral or bacterial infection and so forth. And in Gaucher disease, these cells fill with undigested glycolipid, causing a whole variety of problems, primarily um, bone weakness, because the bone marrow fills with these lipid engul engulfed uh, macrophages. But there are problems with liver, spleen, joints, and others. And the therapy that Genzyme developed, uh, initially based on purifying the enzyme from placenta and work done uh, at NIH, it's produced as a secreted protein in recombinant engineered CHO cells, as now are many other recombinant proteins. But this was one of the first. And then, as I'll describe, the carbohydrate chains, the N-linked oligosaccharides, are treated with successive enzymes, a series of enzymes, to expose the internal trimannose core that has terminal mannose residues, and that's serozyme. It's transfused into the circulation of the Gaucher patients. It does not work if it's free in the blood. In fact, it's quite unstable in the blood. But as I'll explain, there are mannose receptors on the surface of macrophages. They bind the exposed now mannose receptors in the recombinant protein. And it's internalized by receptor-mediated endocytosis. Like other things internalized by endocytosis, it's delivered to lysosomes, it takes up residence, and it degrades the accumulated glucocerebicide. Um, it's based on a lot of basic science in the 70s and 80s, beginning with pattern receptors on the surface of vertebrate cells. That is, yeast cell wall contains mannans, an oligosaccharide that is not normally found on human proteins. And macrophages have mannose receptors here you can see a macrophage engulfing a yeast particle. And you can imagine the mannose receptors on the macrophage cell surface binding to pieces of the yeast cell wall. And with this knowledge, one could take a standard N-linked complex oligosaccharide terminated with sialic acid, n acetylnuraminic acid, galactose, N-acetylglucosamine. So treating with these three enzymes successively removes the sugars in yellow, exposing three mannose residues that are common to all asparagine-linked oligosaccharides. And this is what directs the recombinant protein to macrophages, where it's internalized and transferred to lysosomes. So, what you've seen is Genzyme. It's novel technology. It's a personalized medicine for a rare disease. It costs in the United States between two and three hundred thousand dollars a year. It's a recombinant protein targeted to a specific type of cell, and it's based on glycoengineering. So this is one reason I'm telling you about the Genzyme therapy. There's a second reason. Rare diseases are rare until they're in your own family. 
and then they can become all consuming. As it happens, many years after I left Genzyme in 1989, our oldest daughter was pregnant. She, like her husband, are descendants of Ashkenazic Jews. They were given prenatal tests, which said that each of them was a carrier of Gaucher. Thus, the child she was carrying had a one in four chance of having Gaucher. My daughter, understandably, freaks out, does not know her father knows anything about the subject, has amnio, but asks me to take the call from the geneticist who informed me that the child my daughter was carrying has Gaucher. To make a long story short, Andrew is now, how old is he? He was born in 2002. He's going to be 18 this year. He has Gaucher disease. Here you see him getting an infusion of the serozyme drug. Um, he's completely normal. He's actually well above normal, but we don't need to go there. And a year ago, he completed a cross-country bike trip with these other high school students. But uh, he had to pause twice to get infusions that he needs to do every three weeks. But Genzyme uh, became the rare disease company. It's developed a number of enzyme replacements and now other treatments for rare, in this case, lysosome storage diseases that have literally saved the lives and transformed families with many genetic diseases. So you can see why I've continued to spend a lot of my efforts on rare diseases. Let me go quickly through two of my other companies, very new companies, where we don't have products on the market, but we have quite good funding, dealing with, again, unmet medical needs. And gene therapy, this is a gene therapy company. Let me skip over a few of these slides from Children's Hospital and just get to the heart of the matter, which is Carmine. And as many of you know, Viral vectors and lipid nanoparticles are the current way one uses uh, or one introduces genes, RNAs, uh, oligonucleotides into cells. And the viral vectors, be they lentivirus or adeno associated virus, have issues with immunogenicity and particularly a limited payload capacity, and also a huge manufacturing challenge. That is the AAV gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. The main problem investigators had to solve was manufacturing enough recombinant AAV to uh, treat patients. Um, and repeat dosing becomes a problem because of immunogenicity to the vectors. And non-viral vectors such as lipid nanoparticles also have problems, particularly toxicity. So the technology was developed, as I'll explain, by two of my former students, a married couple, Min Lu and Shi Jiehai, at the City University of Hong Kong. And what they developed, and I'll show you this in a moment, is a way of producing small membrane-limited vesicles from O-negative red cells that can be loaded with a variety of nucleic acids uh, and are non-immunogenic. The manufacturing procedure, and this is now something Carmine, the company, has developed, is scalable. It starts with O-negative blood. O negative being, of course, the universal donor that one can purchase from blood banks, outdated red cells. The red cells are isolated, treated with what is actually now a proprietary ionophore. From each red cell, you get several hundred 
very homogeneous 150 nanometer vesicles. They can be purified by filtration, loaded with, uh, again, proprietary technology with DNA or RNA. They can be stored frozen, they can be frozen and thawed, and they can be hydrated and administered to patients. And this solves, in principle, a number of problems that are plaguing current uh, gene therapy approaches. It's off-the-shelf availability, distribution outside of the liver, manufacturing advantages. This is something academics don't think about, but I think about a lot, and highly efficient. Uh, here's the scientific advisory board. Min and Jihai, who are the academics who started it. Uh, Min is now at the, at the National University of Singapore. Jihai from City U will shortly join her. Um, Zhang Chu Chen is an immunologist at MIT. Mark Kay at Stanford is the former president of the American Society for Gene Therapy. So we're putting together an advisory board that both understands the technology in detail, but can also advise us as to a number of approaches that we can use, a number of nucleic acids that we can use for various genetic diseases. Something from uh, Min and Jihai's Nature paper, uh, you can load these with Cas9 messenger RNA and a guide RNA, this can be delivered in vivo to tumor cells as well as in culture. And you can knock down the target, in this case, an oncogenic microRNA. Uh, we can, with a single shot, uh, perhaps you can see the number at the top right, for several months, get uh, gene expression, in this case, a luciferase in various tissues. And here you can see high-level expression of a recombinant protein in liver. So you begin to see how we can, do, this is all carmine work. Here's another project where they can put DNA, the, the capacity of AED is four and a half kilobases, a little bigger for lentiviruses. Here we can get as much as 30 KD in, and uh, it can work can work in culture, it can work in animals. So my job as head of the Scientific Advisory Board and a member of Board of Directors is to explain to a whole variety of investors and academic scientists and disease foundations what we are up to. And unsurprisingly, uh, we have already won several awards. Many of the large pharmaceutical companies support what are called golden tickets, where in a, comp in a competition, they will give you one year of support at Lab Central, my favorite incubator, and uh, mentoring for projects. Uh, Takeda and Carmine have already entered a very large collaborative project, and we just received this award as one of the fierce 15 biotech companies of 2020. And finally, Tevard, which we're developing gene therapies for a whole class of genetic disorders that have no treatments and are very difficult to work with. These are haplo-insufficient genetic disorders, where loss of only one copy of the gene, generally by a de novo mutation during early development of the child, leads to a devastating disorder. It's one of many that have neuro uh, problems in the development of the brain. Tabard um, is a devastating developmental disorder, uh, epilepsy that can be 40 or more seizures per night, 
Uh, the current therapies reduce the seizures, don't target the root cause of the disease. It's a company I started with two businessmen, not scientists, who are fathers uh, of daughters with this disease. So these are haploinsufficient disorders. And in this case, it's an ion channel called SCN1A, which is expressed throughout the brain but particularly in inhibitory GABAergic neurons. And you can either think about fixing or editing the mutated copy of the gene, or you can increase the expression of the healthy allele. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip ahead just to tell you how we think about and are doing increasing the expression of the healthy allele. I'll spare you the details of our scientific advisory board and board of directors, but it's increasing the output of the wild type gene by in, in, increasing the stability of the messenger RNA and thus the protein output. And it has to do with an intricacy of the genetic code in which many of the codons that are used in messages, mammalian messages particularly, have evolved to be non-optimal. Again, this goes back to the structure of the genetic code when remind you that 18 amino acids have more than one codon. And these codons are not equivalent. Some are optimal in that the tRNAs that read them are present at high levels. But many are non-optimal in that they are decoded by tRNAs that are rare. And what happens has been worked out by a number of investigators, particularly Jeff Collar, then at Case Western, but now at Hopkins, who showed that when a ribosome encounters a non-optimal codon, it pauses with an empty A site. And this brings in decapping and deadenylation factors that lead to messenger RNA degradation. And as it happened, I was visiting Case Western Medical School for other reasons, happened to have a conversation with Jeff where he showed to me the key result in one of his cell papers in yeast, showing that if you change the codons in a message from completely non-optimal to optimal, you increase message stability by a factor of 10 and protein output by a factor of 10. And why I said this, I don't know, but I said to Jeff, could you do the same thing by expressing tRNAs that read these non-optimal codons? And Jeff's response was, yes, but no one's ever done it. Teva sponsored research in Jeff's lab that among other things showed that, well, this was earlier work, that most mammalian messages are unstable. It's very surprising perhaps, but this makes sense. They're encoding proteins that are needed in relatively small amounts. To get to the point with SCN1A, we've identified groups of tRNAs, not individual ones, but groups of tRNAs that read non-optimal codons and in preliminary experiments, we can get a 50% increase in the level of SCN1A. So we're not there yet. This is not a gene therapy, but it's getting close. And again, there are many, many devastating diseases of the CNS that are haploinsufficient. There are many haploinsufficient genetic disorders outside of the CNS. We're about to sign an agreement with a large biotech to explore some of these. So I'm telling you this because it's a work in progress. 
we're very excited by it. It has the potential for treating a number of genetic disorders. As in, almost any of you can immediately see through, this is a risky, unproven technology. We could lose all the money that's been put into the company. I've had several companies already fail, but this is biotechnology. And I can tell you working with Daniel and Warren, the fathers of these girls, you see a dedication that uh, is really very impressive. I met with both of their children and it really is a motivating force to actually know that it has the potential, if not treating these girls, treating others with the same genetic disorder. So I'm pretty much done. Um, what I hope you've learned is the importance of faculty members. Uh, and I'm speaking out of the faculty who are in my audience and to the postdocs and students who want to become faculty. Think about becoming entrepreneurs. Think about in your own towns and universities, developing biotechnology as a means of job creation. I failed to mention the Mass Life Sciences Center reported to the Secretary of Economic Development. It was these gentlemen that I work with very closely. And my own focus on rare diseases, developing drugs from Genzyme, and starting new companies. And my final slide, um, I'm happy to continue, well, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to have any of you write me. So there's my email. But for a number of years, I've been teaching courses in biotechnology, both at the undergraduate and graduate level at MIT. And the graduate course I teach with Andrew Lowe at the Sloan School of Management, the science and business of biotechnology, is now an edX course. It went online in February and it has over 17,000 students. You're all welcome to sign up. It's free. Um, and again, I hope I've encouraged at least some of you to think about taking the work in your own labs and getting it out into the broader community. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. I'm struggling to, here we go. I'm trying to stop my screen share, there we go. So now Bill, you're in charge. You're muted. Thanks, Harvey. Uh, very nice talk. I, I don't see any question in the chat box, but I have one myself. Uh, can, can you dial in rather than increase the recognition of a non-optimal codon, but go the other way? In some cancers, for example, there is an overexpression of certain genes. You don't want to completely shut them down, but you want to bring them down, you know? Can you do that? Probably not with tRNAs, but a number of gene editing technologies and gene cutting technologies are designed to do just that. And uh, here's where RNA editing um, can come into play. It depends on the specifics of the gene, but there's a lot of effort now in drugging some of these oncogenes, either inhibiting their synthesis or getting rid of the proteins completely. You know, proteins like RAS and NIC, which one could never drug, can now at least in principle be drugged. So, um, yes, hopefully, you know, this, this is the kind of work that can best be done in a company because it requires a lot of, a lot of uh, attempts to try different targets. So I have one question for you. Uh, Mathieu Ferron, he said, nice talk in the technology of Carmine Inc. Are the red blood cells 
extracellular vesicles modified to target specifically a given tissue? Ah, wonderful question. Um, we're doing that now, and the answer is yes. Uh, Carmine, together with people in Mindler's lab, uh, you can put peptides covalently linked to surface proteins. For instance, EGF uh, peptides that will bind to the EGF receptor, and that will target them preferentially to cells that express the EGF receptor. Uh, a lot of work is going on with single chain nanobodies, the um, nanobodies that are made in uh, alpacas. Uh, and these have been hooked onto the surface of red blood cells and similarly can target it to cells expressing the EGF receptor. This has mostly been done in, um, in cancer cells, but increasingly we're learning how to target it to tissues such as the liver. So can I just add one of myself for in our- Yeah, I, I just checked in Q&A. Uh, oh yeah, okay, well you're in charge, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, this is one for you. How is the medication treatment reimbursement model in the U.S. versus Canada incite the entrepreneur spirit among researchers? I saw that and I'd like you to answer it. Well, I think uh, we don't have the same model as the United States, but they do favor. Uh, we have some uh, incentives to, to, to apply our uh, research discoveries into uh, a, 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 a starting company, but it's not as strong as it is in Boston, for example, or in California, you know? Uh, I was just wondering whether you could use uh, the same technology to target uh, ACE2 expressing cells for SARS coronavirus, and you can then kill infected cells this way. Uh... Perhaps, uh, the trouble is you wind up killing off the normal lung epithelial cells. Uh, it'd be a little tricky. No, no, but if you direct, let's say, uh, the caste system to degrade. Ah, yes, yes. The viral, the viral genome. You could do that, you could do that. Uh, you know, given the speed at which, it, at which things are moving, uh, for this application, probably not. However, um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has contacted us when they heard about our collaboration and were in active discussion with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, which is very anxious to get gene therapy for the CF patients that cannot be treated with the Vertex drug where you would need essentially to replace the entire cystic fibrosis gene, the CFTR gene. And using our vesicles, uh, we can target from the airway. Preliminary data says we, we target some of the cells that actually express the CFTR protein. And we're working on technologies from to use these vesicles from the blood to target the basal stem cells where one could do long-term gene therapy. So we are very interested in the lung, potentially. Uh, there are a lot of technical problems, but you know, this is, I think, the direction that we see um, coming going. There is a question by Ashley, Ashley Chim. How did you decide to work on tRNA for increasing mRNA stability for eventual drug discovery? It came out of a conversation. Um, I was in Cleveland. I grew up in Cleveland. It's a long story. I've been working for many years with the dean of the medical school to help biotechnology in Cleveland. She arranged for me to talk with Jeff Collar. We had never met. And it was in this discussion where he showed me uh, his work on increasing message stability by optimizing codons. I mean, codon optimization has been done for generations for people who want to make more recombinant protein in human cells, but no one knew why it worked. Jeff told me, and it was simply an idea that I floated to him. And he was intrigued by the idea. 
you know, he, other works on, on altering three prime UTR sequences. He works, yeah, exactly. I mean, there are many ways of doing it. This one looks to be very general. And, you know, this is the one we're pursuing right now. Um, the other approach, by the way, for haploinsufficient genetic disorders is a company which is developing oligonucleotides that will enhance splicing of the message. And that looks promising. So there are these two technologies which will be in competition, and that's good. So on the business side, uh, Al-Bashir Afar asks you, what are the common mistakes that people do in creating companies? <laughs> Lots of them. Um, one, again, going back to the Mass Life Sciences Center, we reviewed applications from probably three or 400 companies who wanted this million dollars to get them over a, uh, a, an early hurdle. And with most of them, either the science, in most of them, the science was actually not sound. It had, too many, you know, if this works and if that works. Uh, so they were very premature in even thinking about a company. And you have to get the right business person to actually steer the company. So it really requires from the very beginning experienced scientists and business people. And ideally a scientific board and a board of directors that even can have two or three people on it each, but people who can convince the funders that they know what they're doing. And then the third thing that is often uh, a problem is intellectual property. I mean, MIT, like a number of American universities, has a very good technology licensing office. So my advice to people when they come to me, as they often do from MIT or elsewhere, you know, I want to start a company, here's my idea, here's the, the, the research. The first thing I say is go to your TLO and file a provisional patent application. Because without intellectual property protection, it's hard to get investors interested in, but they want an exclusive license. So those are three common mistakes that people make. Okay, excuse me, but we have two more questions. Uh, I know you have several, uh, from uh, Arman Kaifi, I know you have several great works on long non-coding RNAs, but I want to ask you, how do you see using long non-coding RNAs as genetic therapy? <sighs> Slowly, if at all, because in most cases, we really don't understand how they work. Um, I should have mentioned my own lab is closed. Uh, I closed it after 53 years. So we're not working on it, but it's only now that one is getting very good ideas of the molecular ways in which they work. Having said that, a number of them are tissue specific. And whether but in general, there are multiple long non-coding RNAs that are required for each cell or tissue to develop. So whether one can manipulate a single one or several remains to be seen. And their processing is also very complicated. They're all made as long RNAs, almost all by PAL2, and they undergo extensive processing. So actually synthesizing them can be a problem. So I don't see it right now, but I hope I prove him wrong in a few years. There's a question from Marie Trudel. What is the half-life survival of the red blood cell extracellular vesicles? That it's very short. It's a couple of hours. Hours? Okay. Yeah. But, you know, it can get to where it needs to go and get taken up and deliver its cargo. That's all you need to do. It's true with a number of other gene therapy vehicles, by the way. So if you put galactose, you could deliver them to liver, right? Correct. Correct. That has not escaped us. <laughs> in fact, um, N-acetylgalactosamine, which is what's used, um, 
that's already been used by Elm Island and other companies to deliver oligonucleotides to liver. So the alnylam transthyroid amyloidosis therapy uses an oligonucleotide that is hooked to three galnac residues. So that's, liver is easy. Liver is straightforward. It's the other tissues that is much more complicated. So a more practical question from one of my students. Uh, he says, great talk, Dr. Lodic. It was an inspiring talk. I wanted to know if there are any efforts, scientific or non-scientific, to lower the cost of personalized medicine, such as the examples from your presentation. Do you see it being available to the general population in the foreseeable future? He comes from India, so you can imagine. No, 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 no. I, this is something of great concern. Um, to begin, we don't know how to pay for gene therapies yet. Um, one of the discussions we have in my science and business class, um, this is now from Andrew Lowe, to give you an idea. Um, if you buy a house for $800,000, you generally do not pay cash. You pay a down payment and you get a 30-year mortgage where you pay $400 a month. 800,000 happens to be the cost of the 2 eye gene therapy by Spark for this inherited form of blindness. In other words, the insurance companies may pay a down payment to the company and then, um, you know, pay a relatively small, relatively, still large, but a relatively smaller amount of money every month. So there are vehicles that go on there where you might stop paying if the therapy doesn't work. But having said that, um, let me not give the background, but basically I'm working with the Gates Foundation and NIH specifically to develop gene therapies for sickle cell disease that can be administered as a one-shot treatment anywhere in the world. Now that is for the future, we can't do it, but NIH and the Gates Foundation are putting in a very large amount of money, I think $500 million, into trying to solve that problem. So I think there is work in that area. It's gonna be a long haul. And the problem is the research itself is expensive, and these are very expensive therapies to manufacture. But, um, Hopefully, the cost will come down in the future. I do not have brilliant ideas how to control the cost, other than this kind of mortgage approach that I've learned from Andrew Lowe. These are very good questions, by the way. I love them. Keep going. <laughs> That's what happens when you have a new, a young audience. I see I have a, a last question here. I don't know if, if I can see it. Uh, and then I think we'll let you go. He says, thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks a lot, Harvey. Really, it was very inspiring talk. And in the name of all my colleagues, we would really love you. Loved your talk. Well, thank you. And I, I hope this is the beginning of a dialogue. Um, I meet regularly with cabinet ministers and politicians. If you think there's somebody I could talk to that would help in doing this Montreal or elsewhere, I've done this many times in many countries. It has not fallen on deaf ears. Uh, uh, you <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying this in all uh, honesty because these are important. These are important concepts. And again, I regularly am contacted by people who have ideas, and some of them are definitely worth moving forward. But anyway, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. We appreciated your talk a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.